today we're going to take a topographic tour through Washington's present and past. Making this presentation got me really excited, so I hope it gets all of you excited too. Um, first, I wanted to acknowledge the inspiration for this presentation title, this cool geologic map from the USGS from a while back called the North America Tapestry of Time and Terrain. I'm not going to be showing geology maps today, but I am going to show how we um, at the Washington Geological Survey use terrain data, particularly LIDAR-derived terrain, to help tell the story of Washington's geology. But before I get started with that, is, any, and this, is this anyone's first time to Washington State? Oh, awesome. Well, welcome to the Evergreen State. Um, Something made me think about this the other day that I'll get to in a second, but as a geographer, I really appreciate, you know, so many of Washington's place names, many, many of which have an indigenous origin. Tacoma, for example, is derived from the name of our closest volcano here, Tahoma, also known as Mount Rainier. Um, but some of the rainy weather this week reminded me that Washington, particularly Western Washington, has a lot of really gloomy place names. Some of my favorites are just north of here. We've got Point No Point. That might be my favorite. Um, <laughs> It's right across from Useless Bay, <laughs> next to Foulweather Bluff. Um, but a couple weeks ago, I was traveling with my family down near the Columbia River, and just down the road from Cape Disappointment um, is Dismal Niche. <laughs> Probably the best, best Washington place name, perhaps. Um, these are my kids doing their best to look dismal. I told them, look sad. So they're, they're really trying there. Um, but this was named, uh, named by Lewis and Clark's Corps of Discovery when they got pinned down there for about a week by a winter storm, kind of hemmed in by the raging Columbia River on one side and the steep forested terrain on the other. So that's actually what I'm here to talk about today is the terrain part, but I just thought I'd share this photo because I thought it was funny. Um, so Washington has a really diverse array of interesting landforms from the low-lying topography of the coast to the lofty peaks of the Cascades over to the channeled scablands, which you all heard about last night from Nick Zentner, if you were around for his talk. Um, you can see where we are here in Tacoma in the state. So today, let's travel to 15 different locations across the state using maps, terrain data, and a few photos as our guide. Okay, we're gonna start with the watery wonderland of Willapa Bay down in the southwest corner of the state, just north of Dismal Niche, by the way. Um, so with many large rivers flowing into it, Willapa Bay is a region clearly defined by water. It's also the second largest riverine estuary on the west coast of the continental U.S. At high tide, the bay covers over 120 square miles. This is an aerial view of the northern part of the bay. But at low tide, over half of that can be exposed as mudflats in the bay. So here's a LIDAR-derived image of that same area. Um, one of the things I, Maggie was talking about really struck me because like these sort of landforms remind me of trees sticking up, these sort of drainage channels. So there's always these connections with other parts of nature in some of these images that really grab me sometimes. Um, but in the case of Willapa Bay, those mudflats are really important. They provide habitat for hundreds of thousands of migratory birds every year. And, you know, in the past century, the bay has also developed a large aquaculture industry on the mudflats. So about one in 10 oysters grown in the U.S. comes from Willapa Bay, actually. All right, let's go north to a little bit bigger topography, Mount Olympus. So Mount Olympus rises about 8,000 feet um, in the heart of the Olympic mountain range. And despite its relatively modest elevation, Mount Olympus harbors several large um, albeit shrinking glaciers, due to the large amount of precipitation that it receives coming off of the Pacific Ocean, mostly in the form of snow. So on the western slope of the peninsula, that precipitation results in a vast temperate rainforest with some of the tallest and biggest trees on Earth. But inversely, over on the eastern slopes, you've got this very distinct rain shadow with far less precipitation. And you can see Squim, Washington gets about 17 inches of rain per year, which is not much for this part of the world. And there are actually places in that rain shadow you can find native prickly pears growing, believe it or not, you know, only a few miles away from these vast rainforests. So kind of neat. Um, so let's move north to Dungeness Spit, also in that rain shadow. And this is one of the coolest features in Washington, I feel like. Dungeness Spit's over five miles long. It's actually the longest natural sand spit in the United States. And it also makes for a fantastic coastal walk, in my opinion. Here's a view looking north toward the Strait of Juan de Fuca and Vancouver Island. 
And then once you get out there on a clear day, you have 360 degree views from the Olympics in the south, northward to Vancouver Island and Mount Baker in the other direction. Just a gorgeous place. Um, the area around the spit also has a ton of features named Dungeness, as you can see here. Um, and it was named after um, a place in, in England, I believe. But that name was also passed on to an animal that lives in Dungeness Bay that you might be familiar with. This little guy, the Dungeness Crab. So it's actually named after this location. All right, let's keep this whirlwind tri trip going northward to Susha Island in the San Juans. So as you can see in this map, Susha Island has a really distinctive horseshoe shape with many natural harbors around the island. Those natural harbors make this a great place to go boating, sailing, kayaking. It's a great spot for that. Most of the islands also uh, Washington State Park. So there's tons of cool little secluded beaches, lots of miles of trails, just a really neat place. Um, from the geographic perspective, here's an aerial view of Susha and uh, Patos Island to the north. And geologic perspective, it's really interesting. You can see in this bathymetry that those sort of curved shape of the, the landscape keeps going underwater. And that's the result of this being a big folded um, uh, a folded feature of sedimentary rocks. Most of the rocks here are the Chuckanut Formation, which make up most, most of the area around Bellingham. But the really interesting part of Susha is this outermost layer, made up of really, really old Cretaceous rocks, which is, of course, from the age of dinosaurs. So as luck would have it, back in 2012, two Burke Museum paleontologists were out there um, wandering around, and they found this really interesting find, an 80-million-year-old theropod bone. And this is actually the first and only dinosaur bone ever to be found in the state of Washington. And as of last year, the informally named Sushasaurus rex is now the official Washington state dinosaur. All right, from Susha down to near where I live, um, we're going to travel to the mysterious Mima Prairie down near Olympia. So Mima Prairie is covered in these really small hills called Mima Mounds. And these eponymous mounds also occur on other glacial outwash prairies in the southern Puget Lowlands. Um, but nobody knows why they're there or how they got there. Nobody can agree on it. So here's an early morning view of Mima Prairie. And here is a LIDAR scan of that same area. So these mounds are about 20 to 30 feet across and about six feet tall at their, their highest. So earthquakes, floods, gophers, aliens, many explanations have been proposed for these formations, but nobody can really universally agree on how they were formed. Um, here's a LIDAR view, which gives you a really good idea of just how consistent these landforms are. Super weird place. Um, so let's go from some of the smallest landforms to some of the, one of the biggest up north to Mount Baker, also known as Kalshan. So here's Mount Baker from Baker Lake on the east side. And this mountain is one of five large stratovolcanoes in Washington state. It's the tallest peak in the North Cascades, so it's a very prominent figure. You'll often see it flying in and out of Seattle to the north. Um, the area around Mount Baker is one of the snowiest places on, on the, the whole planet, really. Um, the nearby Mount Baker ski area averages about 50 feet of snow per year, so just a ridiculous amount of snow. And that heavy precipitation feeds these large glaciers on the volcano, shown here in this LIDAR visualization. Okay, let's move southward to a different volcano, one you might be familiar with, Mount St. Helens. So before 1980, Mount St. Helens looked a lot like Mount Baker, very similar in its sort of symmetrical ice-capped appearance. And then this happened in 1980, of course, um, catastrophically changing the mountain and its surrounding landscape. So in the four decades since then, however, the mountain has started to grow back. Two big lava domes have grown in the crater. A large glacier has grown in the crater. And LIDAR has been used to capture a lot of these changes by the USGS. So pick one of these sides to look at. And I'm just going to click through from 2002 to 2009. You can see some of those changes. And these, the crater glacier has continued to grow since then. Um, here's the view looking in at that upper lava dome and the crater glacier. So two years ago, in cooperation with the USGS, we also published an interpretive map of Mount St. Helens that featured different ways the landscape of the mountain has changed in the past four decades. 
including those lava domes and the Crater Glacier. So I just wanted to shout out to fellow cartographer Sarah Bell for her fantastic Bell Topo Sands font that was used in this map. It's awesome. Um, I also encourage you to check out Joe Bard's talk tomorrow. He's going to be talking on documenting the historical topography of Mount St. Helens. It's going to be super interesting. So check that out. All right, back to the North Cascades, Lake Chelan. Lake Chelan is it's a remarkable 50-mile-long glacially carved lake in the North Cascades. It just slices right through the mountains. And at almost 1,500 feet deep, Lake Chelan is one of the deepest lakes in North America. Only Crater Lake and Lake Tahoe are deeper. Um, on this map, we used a familiar Washington icon, the Space Needle, to kind of use as a measuring stick for seeing how deep it is. So it's two and a half Space Needles deep, as you can see. Um, all right down to the Columbia River Gorge and the Bonneville landslide. So 600 years ago, the entire side of this mountain collapsed and created a natural dam on the Columbia River known as the Bridge of the Gods. And eventually that dam was breached and part of the landslide deposit was washed away, but most of it actually still protrudes into the Columbia River. This is an aerial view of that deposit, um, also known as the Bonneville landslide. So we wanted to create a map to kind of tell this geologic story so we switched to LIDAR, highlighted that landslide in orange. You can see how big it is. And then added context to make the map. We also added this little sort of graphical feature of the modern day Bridge of the Gods, which is a bridge that goes over the Columbia. This is where the Pacific Crest Trail crosses from Oregon to Washington, by the way. Um, just to kind of relate that large geologic scale to a more human scale. And in this photo from 1929, you can see that bridge is there, built in the 20s, next to the Bonneville landslide. This is viewed from a different direction upstream. But I just want to note the Cascade was rapids there. Before the Bonneville Dam was built and drowned this area, these rapids were here. And this name gave rise to the name of the nearby mountain range, the Cascade Range. So if we wouldn't have had this landslide 600 years ago, we might not have the name Cascade Range. OK. Not everything in, in Washington is covered in big green trees, so we'll go to the Juniper Dunes. Just north of the confluence of the Snake River and Columbia River is this 7,000-acre Juniper Dune wilderness. And this arid, windswept landscape is the northernmost habitat for the western juniper tree. So those little dark specks that you can barely see in those dunes are those trees. If we switch to the LIDAR view, you can really clearly see that far edge, the leeward edge of that dune field. All right, so let's follow the Snake River down to the very corner of the state and the Grand Rondes. So the Grand Ronde River flows through the edge of the Blue Mountains in Washington. It's a range that extends over the border just from Oregon, just into Washington. And this river has carved its path over the millennia into that Columbia River basalt, all those different lava flows you see there. And those entrenched meanders, they're also known as goosenecks. Um, and they're part of the Grand Ronde's actually been designated a natural national or national natural landmark. It's a tongue twister, um, based on these textbook geologic landforms. Here's a zoomed out view of its confluence with the Snake River. Okay, let's move north to another natural landmark, Steptoe Butte. So Steptoe Butte is on this really interesting part of Washington called the Palouse. It's a major agricultural section of the state. And it's covered in windblown glacial sediment. I think Nick Zentner had some photos of this area last night. But right in the middle is this sort of anomalous hill that rises 1,000 feet above the surrounding landscape called Steptoe Butte. And Steptoe Butte's made up of quartzite. It's over 400 million years old. So it's sticking up above this much younger um, glacial lus and the underlying lava flows that surround the mountain. And it, this is interesting because the word stepto is actually a geologic term that's named after this place, and it just means an older hill that projects above surrounding lava flows. So Stepto Butte, though, it's mostly well known to photographers because it gives you views like this in the springtime and like this in the fall. Just a gorgeous, um, a gorgeous view of the surrounding agricultural lands. OK, up to some even older rocks up in the other corner of the state. So Crowell Ridge is right at the edge of the Selkirk Range, which is composed of some of the oldest rocks in Washington state. These ones are about 700 million years old. 
Um, I was trying to make some sort of LiDAR image of it one day, and I was getting really frustrated, and I wasn't having much luck. Maybe it was this weird blue color that I added to the mountains for some reason. Um, so I went to change that blue color, and I accidentally turned off the hillshade instead. And I was like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Um, I immediately loved it. It looked like a, a photo, you know, a misty mountain photo in the morning flying over. It also reminded me of Cheney Swinney. I know I saw you. There you are. It reminded me of Cheney's Peakscape series. So if you haven't seen those, check those out because they're way better than this. But um, I was like, okay, might be onto something here. So I exported this to Photoshop, added a little gradient, and it just goes to show that sometimes a mistake can turn out all right. Um, so I was like, let's try this on a different mountain range. Let's go to the enchantments in the Cascades. So if you hadn't, haven't heard of the enchantments, they're characterized by these really beautiful jagged granitic peaks. Um, in the fall, you get these beautiful yellow larch trees changing color, speckled lakes all over the place. So I, I thought, let's try, it, let's try it with this jagged landscape. So to start with, I made this sort of pre-dawn misty mountain view. And I thought, let's add some hill shading to it. Oh, it looks like the sun's coming up. Let's keep it going. Little Alpen glow. Let's just make a map out of it. What the heck? <laughs> um, so there's the, the major peaks of the enchantments. It's also known as the Stewart Range as well. OK, last but not least, Dry Falls. We heard a little bit about this last night. Um, in my opinion, this is the coolest pl place in the whole state. If you ever get the chance to go there, check it out. It's hard to comprehend unless you're standing there next to this place. Um, but Dry Falls is it's quite possibly the most geologically significant place in the entire state, as you heard last night if you were here. Um, this is kind of from the visitor center, the view of just part of the area. So these slides were in there last night. I had no idea Nick Zemmer was going to be showing these or talking about these, so I apologize for the repetition if you saw those. But basically, a long time ago during the last ice age, there was an ice dam. And there's evidence that this ice dam um, got breached several times and water flowed across the landscape, scouring much of eastern Washington. Here's the location at Dry Falls, just to give you some context within Washington. And the water flowing through this area is thought to have produced the largest waterfall ever known. Just to give you an idea, they, people have calculated that they think it was carrying approximately 10 times the amount of water as all the world's present day rivers combined. So just absolutely insane amount of water. Um, so up, in up until recently, we didn't have LIDAR for this region, but in the past year, that has changed. So here's a top-down view of that waterfall complex. The water flowed across this direction. Um, every time you had a subsequent flood, it eroded that back each time. But to give you an idea of size, it's three and a half miles wide. So a waterfall up to three and a half miles wide, which for context is about four times as wide as all of the Niagara Falls waterfall complexes. So just gigantic. And these cliffs are so wide, they're hard to photograph. Even from an airplane, I tried. It didn't really turn out so great. But now that we have LIDAR, we can go anywhere we want. So with 3D terrain data, this vast geologic feature can be better visualized. And this is going to be the base image for our next interpretive geologic map in the coming year. So look forward for that. All right, we made it. I hope you enjoyed this whirlwind topographic trip around Washington. Here's my obligatory credit slide and my information. Thank you very much for listening. Appreciate it. <laughs>